It's impossible to look at a koala and not think of Australia. This furry marsupial, which normally spends most of the daytime sleeping, has become a potent symbol of Australia, almost eclipsing the kangaroo in recent years, thanks to his starring role in all those commercials. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and this is Stanley, who lives here at Lone Pine Sanctuary in Brisbane. It's hard to get too serious about anything when you're holding a koala, but the truth is that Stanley wouldn't be here if it weren't for these, eucalyptus or gum tree leaves. They're the only thing the koala eats. No gum trees, no koalas. Which brings us to the subject of our third program on Australia's natural history, the forests of this island continent. Today, not much of Australia is covered with trees. Only 7% of her vast surface is forested. In former times, when the entire continent was situated farther south and the climate was wetter, the forests were much more widespread. And it was these ancient forests which were the evolutionary cradle for so many of Australia's fascinating marsupials, including the koala. Fifty million years ago, all of Australia was covered by a mantle of dense rainforest. This green luxuriance was the cradle of evolution for the unique plants and animals that now give Australia such a distinctive character. Today, three quarters of the continent is arid, but some fragments of that primeval jungle remain, mostly here in the tropical northeast. It's a living museum where the very beginnings of the bush survive. The canopy is so dense here that in the cooler winter, Pythons emerge from the trees to warm themselves in the sun. Today, this is one of the few places on the arid continent where the struggle of life is not for water, but for light. On the forest floor, where it's dark, the young plants must battle to survive. These plants have evolved ingenious solutions to compete in their race to the sky. Vines send out tendrils or barbed hooks to claw their way swiftly to the top, using existing trees for support. Some figs get a head start by germinating their seeds high up in the canopy, then sending down roots which eventually strangle their host. The fig itself grows on and pushes its massive crown high above the forest roof. There's a constant jostle for light and space in the canopy, and the crowns weave together into a dense and billowing layer. 
In the gloom beneath the canopy, there's not much light for seeds to grow. So they're packed in fruit to entice birds into eating them and carrying the vital contents away. Where there are birds, there are nests and eggs, food for the green tree snakes that patrol the upper story. Only the flesh of the fruit is digested. The seeds simply pass through the gut. The more birds eat, the more seeds get scattered around the forest. The fruit that does fall to the ground may be picked up by cassowaries a flightless bird unique to Australia and New Guinea. They too void the seeds, usually in clearings where there's more light, giving the seeds a better chance of developing. Such a wealth of food within easy reach gives certain birds more time to devote to breeding. Male bower birds have become skilled artists and builders in their quest for a mate. On the dim forest floor, the decorated structures are marvels of art and architecture, designed solely to attract and impress females. Among the golden bower birds, these courtship theaters are passed down through generations, freshly embellished with mosses and lichens. The more brilliant the plumage, the less elaborate the bower. This regent bower bird has a fairly modest arena, but he still can't afford to leave it for long because other males may try to take it over. Male satin bower birds make an avenue. Twin rows of twigs are glued in place with a mixture of charcoal and saliva and later painted with crushed plants. It's impressive enough to lure a hen. The sight of her excites the artist into a brilliant song and dance. The male will mate with as many partners as he can attract. His row ends with breeding, and the hens will be left to build a nest and raise their chicks alone. As well as dispersing seeds, birds play another important part in the forest's procreation as pollinators. Up in the canopy, plants compete for the animals that carry their pollen. Perhaps that's why this bumpy satin ash grows its flowers directly from the trunk to catch the passing traffic of honey eaters. A rich flow of nectar rewards them for taking pollen between trees and fertilizing the flowers. night falls, the mammals emerge. Among them are tree kangaroos, which despite their name, spend as much time on the ground as aloft. Ring-tailed possums prefer the canopy, where they find some of their favorite foliage. Flowers are especially prized. Their scent brings even more visitors to the satin ash to harvest the nectar and collect the pollen.
Like the honey eaters, the blossom bats have long tongues tipped with tiny brushes to soak up the sweet liquid. Flowers provide their only source of food, and enough pollen sticks to their whiskers and fur to make these tiny bats gentle and reliable go-betweens. The trees derive no benefit from this possum. The Herbert River ringtail relishes the flowers as a welcome break from its usual fare of leaves. Possums first evolved in the rainforests, and over time they diversified, moving into many new environments. These ringtails, however, remain rainforest specialists. While most of the larger species feed on leaves and other plant food, this small and elusive striped possum prefers insects. Searching along the rotting and dying trees, it tears at the bark with sharp teeth and digs out wood-boring grubs. Its hands tap along the wood for the hollow sounds that betray the presence of borers. The fourth finger on each hand is much longer than the others, and it's tipped with a sharp claw to skewer fat and juicy grubs from deep inside the rotting timber. Today, this pretty striped possum is hard to find. The rotten decay that's so much a part of this dense and wet forest provides plenty to eat here, but its special way of life left it unprepared for a great climatic change which began 15 million years ago as the island continent drifted north into the tropics. Australia started to dry out, and most of the rainforests and their inhabitants vanished. But among the plants were some that adapted. It was these marginal, hardier plants that took over, while the ancestral forests retreated to a few pockets. From among the new plants rose a group that spread around Australia in splendid variety the eucalypts, or gum trees. They reach their most majestic form in the mountain ash. Growing to over 300 feet, it's the tallest flowering plant in the world. And with its light and airy crown, it's the king of the eucalypts. This open canopy lets through much more light than the rainforest it replaced. And in these higher, wetter areas, it allows an understory of tree ferns to flourish, a backdrop of green lace for what sounds like a great chorus of birds. In fact, all the songs have just one singer, the lyrebird a uniquely Australian master of both mimicry and display. His aim is to persuade females nearby that he's a fine and healthy specimen, well worthy of fathering their chicks.
This hen seems to have heard it all before, and she's more interested in the insects hiding in the litter. But in time, the display will work its spell. Eucalypt forests are spacious and uncluttered, and that gave some of the possums added impetus to turn leaping into gliding as a means of getting around. Folds of skin that stretch between the fore and hind limbs of the leaping possums evolved into strong and supple membranes to carry sugar gliders and their kin on long flights through the open forests. Gliding doesn't use as much energy as climbing, and it's an economical way for possums to harvest a special food provided by some kinds of widely scattered gums. In these uncommon trees, a sugary sap flows close to the outer skin. With a slash of sharp teeth, it oozes out to become a rich and sustaining food. These sap trees are few and far between, and so sugar gliders band together to defend this precious resource. As a result, they've become the most social of the possums. It's a society where the chief language is not sound, but smell, and a complex idiom it is. Whenever gliders meet, they stop to sniff and refresh their communal scent. Scent glands are in the most unlikely places, under the chin, on the forehead, and even under the feet. As well as the tribal odor, there are subtle blends that tell who's who in the social order, and details of sex. For instance, whether this female is ready to mate. The unfamiliar odor all around will soon warn this stranger that he's in the wrong place. To warn all comers that this is occupied territory, the resident males smear pungent trails around the tribal range. A strong scent from glands around the vent is mixed with drops of urine. Again, it's scent, or rather the lack of a familiar one that marks out an intruder. His body odor declares him to be a male, but a very young one and no real threat. Before dawn breaks, the gliders make their way to the communal den. Such a tight squeeze keeps out larger possums and gives protection against enemies. Inside the eucalypt hollow, it's also a snug fit. Some colonies have as many as eight gliders bedding down together. Sharing body warmth saves energy and helps to pass around the all-important tribal scent.
The eucalypts foliage is much more open than that of the rainforest trees from which they evolved, with smaller, hardier leaves to withstand the climate as Australia became drier over the ages. The leaves hang angled away from the sun to keep water loss down, and to make them unpalatable, they're loaded with potent cocktails of toxins and oils. Despite this, some animals have found ways of breaching the eucalypt's defenses, and they form a web of life that extends even into the streams flowing through the forest. The leaves fall all year round, and the moment they hit the water, the first of a long line of leaf shredders goes to work. Caddisfly larvae, armored in a suit of sand grains and plant fragments, reduce the leaf to a skeleton, carefully munching their way around the poisonous oil glands. The bits of leaf get broken down further and are swept downstream. Some get caught in a tiny net spun by another kind of caddis larva. Instead of having a portable suit of armor, this one builds a fortress out of tiny pebbles. It's such a good spot that another larva mounts an assault on the miniature castle and takes over. The usurper's first task is to improve and strengthen the structure. One side of the fortress serves to anchor the net and with all the rebuilding, it's become rather tattered and torn. When the last pebble is securely in place, the caddis sets about reweaving its gossamer snare, producing sticky threads much like a spider's. The net is delicate but tough only five millimeters across, yet sturdy enough to catch and hold the bits of broken down leaf swept into it by the strong current. These creatures belong to very ancient families. It's only the leaves on which all their lives depend that have changed from rainforest to eucalypt. The leaf shredders and net spinners become food for larger insects and crustaceans. And there are enough of those to help feed the platypus, which lives much as it did when rainforests covered the land. Change becomes more apparent farther downstream in the drier woodland of the lower rainfall country. The soils are poorer here, and the gum trees don't grow as tall. They're more gaunt and spare than the eucalypts of the higher ranges. This is the characteristic Australian bush. Unlike their rainforest ancestors, gums don't make fleshy fruit. Instead, seeds are packed in woody cases to prevent them from drying out. It takes the strong, sharp beaks of birds like parrots to crack them. A colorful company of cockatoos, parakeets, rosellas, and lorikeets feeds on gum nuts and berries, deftly peeling them with tongue and beak. The open canopy allows a lot of sun to reach the ground. There's plenty of light and space for seeds to germinate and grow, and the eucalypts have no need to bribe birds to carry the seeds away. Though parrots break open the seeds, destroying some, 
many seeds survive. But the sun also dries the litter as it builds up, accumulating fuel for another powerful force that molded the nature of Australia, fire. Surprisingly, the eucalypts came to thrive on fire. Their ability to sprout new growth from underneath the bark and root systems that support several tree trunks are characteristics that first developed to cope with poor soil and drought. Now they help them deal with fire. In the aftermath, the bush looks black and lifeless, but it's far from dead. Already, the wombats, which hid from the flames in their burrows, are out, squabbling over bits of plant food left unburned. The eucalypts live on. The reserve shoots and buds under the bark and the main branches begin to sprout. And within weeks, they're veiled in green again. The fresh growth attracts armies of insects, for leaves are best eaten when they're young and tender, even though they're already loaded with defensive toxins. A vast array of suckers, cutters, nibblers, and munchers goes to work. They're mostly the larvae of moths and butterflies, and they consume great quantities of leaves. Some simply nibble their way around the chemical defenses. Others are immune. Because the eucalypts can put out new growth repeatedly, they can endure more insect attacks than many other trees. insects, and still the trees survive. They do attract some allies in the insect wars, though even a legion of praying mantises wouldn't take much of a bite out of the hordes of leaf eaters. But the intervention of this bell miner actually works against the trees. The reason for that is its fondness for the small sugary domes that form on the leaves of some eucalypts. They're called lerps, and they're made by the larvae of psyllid insects to protect their soft bodies from the sun while they suck the sap from the leaves. The psyllids digest what they need from the sap and use the waste to build their sunshades. At first, the material is soft and pliable, and the larva can work it into shapes.
Eventually, the fruit of two hours of patient labor hardens into a tiny house of sweet glass. Bell miners relish the stuff and carefully remove the domes, leaving the insects to manufacture more. They chase other birds away, birds that eat the insects as well as their shelters. And that's a problem for the eucalypts. For with the bell miners protecting the psyllids and taking their domes, the insect's appetite for leaf sap becomes even more voracious. The eucalypts can't count this bird among their friends either. It's gone into partnership with a parasitic plant, the tropical mistletoe. The mistletoe taps into the eucalypts for its own growth, and it employs the mistletoe bird to spread its seeds and gain a root hold. This bird has a specially designed digestive tract. Berries go directly into the intestine and bypass the stomach. That way they go through very quickly, and when the partly digested berries emerge, they are still sticky. The seeds are dropped high in another tree, lodge in the bark, and sprout. One eucalypt may carry several mistletoes and struggle to survive. The mistletoe is at the center of another even more remarkable relationship. At the base of some host trees, the caterpillars of azure butterflies are tended by sugar ants, which give them shelter in their own nests. Every night, the caterpillars go on a long and dangerous trek to the top of the trees to feed on the mistletoe leaves. The ants go with them, guarding them against spiders and other enemies. In return, the caterpillars supply the ants with a rich, sugary liquid from their body glands. In their rise to dominance over the last two million years, the eucalypts formed a range of extraordinary associations. But most involve birds and insects, which either avoid or cope with the toxic leaves. By contrast, only a few leaf-eating marsupials have been able to adapt. Of all the rainforest ring-tailed possums, only the common ring-tail thrives in these drier woodlands. It's successful because its digestion can cope with the oils and toxins in the eucalypt foliage, which is the most abundant food here. As soon as they're out of the pouch, the baby possums start weaning on the tough plant food that will be their adult fare. They reach the fragile outer branches with the help of a grasping tail, which also makes a handy carrier for nesting material. The leaves that pose the marsupials with such a digestive challenge make a dry, hard litter, which takes a long time to break down. But enough insects and other invertebrates live among it to provide a good living for this Antichinus. Its hunting skill is extraordinary.
speed and a single-minded ferocity enable it to tackle almost any kind of prey. But it's the Antichinus's sex life that's even more remarkable. There, too, ferocity is the hallmark. With the advent of the mating season, males competing for females fight each other to exhaustion. The male sex drive is especially urgent with Antichinus, as they have only one season to reproduce. It makes their couplings fairly brutal and lengthy. All this frantic breeding is lethal. It takes tremendous energy and produces great tension. The males hardly eat, their teeth fall out, they get gastric ulcers, and their stress hormones rise to levels so high that their immune system fails. By the end of the season, they're all dead, leaving only the pregnant females. It's a high price to pay for breeding success but there is sense in it. Small mammals don't live very long, and among the Antichinus, evolution has favored males which put all their reproductive effort into their first and only mating season. Success lies not in personal survival, but in how many young are fathered to ensure that the line is carried on. The challenge of procreation in these woodlands has fashioned other equally intriguing strategies. Many of the birds here form extended families to share the task of rearing young. Several generations of kookaburras, older brothers, sisters, unattached uncles and aunts, pitch in with feeding and even help to incubate the eggs. Communal breeding is a way of giving chicks a better chance in an environment where food supplies aren't always reliable. But animals don't usually do anything for nothing. By helping close relatives raise their young, they ensure the survival of their own genetic heritage. The Galah's strategy is to form a lifelong bond with one mate. Pairs come back to nest in the same tree hollow year after year. Hollows are fairly safe places, but no bond is strong enough to guard against lace monitors on the prowl. Though they're active for only a short time each day, their acute senses of taste and smell and their great climbing skill make them the most feared predator in these parts. It's just another meal for the lace monitor, 
But for the Galahs, it's the end of their chance to rear a family this season. Beneath the eucalypts live banksias, ancient plants going back to the primeval rainforest. They're inhabited by pygmy possums, which often move into the vacant bird's nests and dine on passing insects. Insects are relished, but the Banksias themselves provide their small guests with even more important nourishment. The pygmy possums feed on the Banksias' nectar, and in doing so, help to pollinate the flower. The possum babies soon get the hang of clambering around. After all, the pygmy possums and banksias evolved together over an immensely long time. The shape of the flowers suits these nocturnal pollinators. Each spike has hundreds of tiny flowers densely packed together to provide support and plenty of nectar and pollen. Banksias and their relatives come splendidly into their own in the heathlands, especially here in Western Australia. In these ancient leached soils, so poor they're almost pure sand, plants and animals evolved a great variety of lifestyles to share the meager resources in this difficult climate. So many flowers eager to attract pollinators have fostered a matching diversity of insects. Many, like these jewel beetles, are rewarded with nectar, but some plants show even greater entrepreneurial flair. Honey eaters make good go-betweens, and many plants employ them. Even more recruit insects, and the result is a wonderful assortment of shapes designed to suit the various visitors. Certain plants even resort to fraud to seduce insects. One group of orchids cunningly exploits the sexual habits of this wasp, habits remarkable enough in themselves. The female has no wings, and when she's ready to mate, she rubs off chemical signals for a male to come and fly off with her. The wasps mate on the wing, and still coupled end to end, he takes her to some nectar-rich flowers. Now he feeds, still attached to his partner. She can't feed herself, but when he's had his fill, he rubs her abdomen, which prompts her to curl forward and receive a few drops from his mouth. Feeding her is his investment in the eggs now forming in her body. The whole method hangs on the chemical signal she sends out, and the orchids have evolved almost identical signals to trick the male wasps into trying to copulate with them 
and so become their pollen carriers. This hammer orchid looks, as well as smells, like a female wasp. And he keeps on trying to mate even when the orchid flips him onto its pollen-bearing part. Such mimicry is an economical way of seducing pollinators without having to supply nectar, a great advantage in these poor soils. The plants that use birds do give a reward but the flowers are shaped so that the visitor has to collect a dab of pollen as well. The honey eaters are also matched to the task. Inside the long bill, there's a long tongue tipped with a brush to soak up the nectar. Instead of opting for one particular kind of pollinator, banksias play the field. Their dense blooms are arranged to tempt various honey eaters. Reward them with nectar, and ensure they carry away pollen. But those same blooms also support a much more ancient partnership with this extraordinary animal. Much smaller than a mouse, the marsupial honey possum is one of the very few mammals in the world designed to feed exclusively on nectar and pollen. Like the honey-eating birds, it has a long tongue fitted with a brush at the end. The partnership began in the ancestral rainforests, and while many other plants and animals vanished, the honey possum stayed with the banksias as they became transformed into these hardy plants of the bush. In the eucalypts that fringe the heathlands lives another very specialized marsupial, the numbat. Its survival is linked closely to termites that became abundant as the Australian landscape dried out. Unique among marsupials, they become active only by day when the termites they feed on move near the surface and into fallen timber. The stripes are good camouflage, but stepping out into the broad daylight still makes the numbats very cautious. This kind of eucalypt woodland provides a plentiful supply of the wood-eating termites that the numbats prefer. And they're well equipped to harvest them with a tongue that unrolls to half their body length. It's a specialized way of life, and it's enabled the numbats to live through the ever-drying climate that made the bush. The rise of the eucalypts offered a secure place for any marsupial that could digest their foliage. Some possums manage it, but it's the koala that's come to typify the supreme gum specialist. Its gut has special bacteria to extract all it needs from just a few types of eucalypt leaves. Koala life revolves around a small range of gums, just 17 species out of nearly 600. Mating is what's on the mind of this old dominant bull now. The female is still carrying last year's young, and she sees the approach as a threat to herself and her joey. She's much lighter and can move out to thinner branches where he can't follow. Despite the awkward way they clamber around, 
They're superbly adapted to life in the trees, although their closest relatives are ground dwellers, the wombats. The old bull is about to suffer more frustration. A young rival has come into his range with designs on a young female. Commotion sends the king koala hurrying to protect his mating rights. If this intruder manages to impregnate one of his consorts, there's one less chance of fathering his own cub. experienced campaigner. His tactic is to drive the young rival far out on a slender limb. Now the choice is to fall or risk an escape past the old king. Peace returns, but the tension remains. Sooner or later, the young male will try his luck again. He may even displace the old bull and become the new ruler. It'll make no difference to the females. They'll continue to care for their young and when the time is right, receive the seed for the next generation. It's important for Joey to stay close to mother, not only for milk, but also to be fed with pre-digested leaves. This gives him the special bacteria needed to process gum leaves, his only food in adult life. Of all the marsupials, the koalas have tied their fortunes most closely to the eucalypts. It's the quintessential partnership in the bush, a partnership that could only have evolved in Australia. <laughs>